Welcome everyone to oh. the next to last program in the second season of Stories to Share. Uh, and welcome to those of you who are attending remotely. My name is Joe Steinfield and I am the moderator of Stories to Share. And today we are really very fortunate uh, to have with us Deborah Shakespeare Thurber. And when I think about it, this program has existed for almost two years. Her program, Project Shakespeare, has existed for 29 years. And today we will hear something about where she came from, how she got here, and what her project has done to transform not just the community, but kids from 5 to 18. And in talking with Deborah and doing a little preparation for today, I ran across a comment from her, I'm always doing Shakespeare, it consumes my life. Well, it didn't start in Jaffrey. It started in Boston after our speaker made her way from her birthplace in Los Angeles up to the age of nine, and then to St. Louis, where the smart kids got free tickets to see the Cardinals play. She was a smart kid. And uh, from there to Boston, which is where this project began and from Boston to Nashua, and then early in this century from Nashua to Jaffrey. And as you know, Stories to Share always features people here in the Monadnock region. And not only those of us who have gone to performances, but tens, hundreds of children have benefited greatly from what this woman has brought to this region. So it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Deborah Shakespeare Thurman. Well, to start things off, I had the title of this wrong. I've been saying it's stories to tell instead of stories to share. And it's interesting because you know when you start a book and you have the title of the book and you're reading through the book and you wait till you get the place in the book where that title makes sense to you? Yes? Yes? yes. Okay. So that's what I thought about this. Stories. So I renamed your program. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> stories to tell. Because I was thinking, well, everyone has stories to tell. And then I was trying to think, what is important about that title, Stories to Tell? Mm -hmm. And what story do I have to tell and why is it important? So, and I've been thinking about this for many months. I've overthought this probably, so <laughs> bear with me. And it's all friends in this room and thank you for that. Um, what is it about stories? We all have them. And we live in such a divided world right now. I thought, what is the importance of stories? And to me, the importance of stories is that's where we find our common ground. And when we find common ground, then we can go forward. And we are sort of bridging that divide. So sort of hold on to that thought as I trace you through how I got to Project Shakespeare. So I was thinking to myself, I could do this the easy way, which is do the same spiel that I do at the Rotary, at you know different places before a show, tell you about Project Shakespeare, how it started my youth education program. Or I could take this opportunity, sort of like a good book, to do a little self-reflection, to do a little dig digging into my past and figure out what was it? What were the choices, whether I chose them or someone else chose them for me, that got me to the place I am now? And of course, I chose the more difficult path than the easy path. <laughs> so yes, I started in Los Angeles, California. 
My father was a film editor for then Republic Studios. Anyone remember Republic Studios? Maybe. Became Universal Studios, and he did commercials, and he did some TV, Dragnet, and he did, um, he did Orson Welles, I don't know, something with him, I've been told. I don't know. But uh, what he did do is he put my sister, who's almost seven years older than I am, into an acting class for children in the industry. And my sister could have cared less. But I got to be her scene partner. I got to work with her. And so, young, 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 young Deborah, which of course I didn't go by Deborah then, but um, little Debbie, oh, I can't even believe I said that, um, was just like, oh my gosh, I can tell stories through these characters in this class. And I was just, I was thrilled. And my sister didn't like it, but I loved being her scene partner. So I would say that's where the spark, if you will, of wanting to tell stories in my life began. So then we go and we do. We, I moved to St. Louis, Missouri, and we start in the city, and then my mother moves us to the suburbs. By this time, um, unfortunately, my father did die uh, when I was nine. And so all of that, all of that industry, movies, Los Angeles, blah, 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 gone. I am now in the middle of this city in the Midwest and, and I like a foreign, like a foreign country. Um, but in my neighborhood were a lot of kids. And so I realized as I was doing this, this thing, I started my first theater company at age 10. When I got all the kids in the neighborhood together, I wrote a play, I started the play, I directed the play, and we did it in the basement. I wish I could tell you like I got lots of money to give to charity, but I have no idea what I did with that part of it. Um, but that would have been my first theater company. Elementary school, there was no drama in my school. And in middle school, there was no drama. So um, I created my own. You know how all of us have that favorite TV show? Okay. Do you guys remember The Man from Uncle? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Do you remember Ilya Kuryakin? I said it yesterday. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The, 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 the Russian, yeah. Oh, my God. Poster on the wall, everything. So I created with all of my fringe, you know, friends, because we were the misfits in the school, of course. Um, and we started this whole spy ring and we did all this. We were spying on teachers. We were talking into our lipsticks. We were doing all this and we created this whole play that we did throughout middle school until the principal finally did call me into the office and said, enough. So, um, so I just created, again, I created my own little theater company, if you will. I also ran into a teacher, my first crush on a teacher, Mrs. Sachs, who was a visual artist. Oh my gosh, she got me drawing and painting and sculpting. And I thought I was going from performing arts into visual arts. But little did I realize that that visual art training that I was having would really help me when I went to grad school and I had to do costume design and set design and light design um, because I could do a little bit of drawing. Finally, I get to high school and I have two female mentors in uh, Mrs. Worthington, who I thought at the time was really, really old. I bet she was in her 40s. <laughs> but at the time, I thought she was really, really old and really strict and really mean and really tough. And then there was the other woman, Barbara Higgins, who I remember was blonde with one of those little flips and blue eyes and just as sweet as can be. In high school, I didn't get cast in most of the plays. And if I did, I was in like the back row, or I was, you know, the strawberry vendor in Oliver, or I had one line in Oklahoma. Um, but I did do tech theater because I said, well, if I'm not acting in them, what else can I do? So I did marketing, I did posters, I did sets, I did costumes. I was voted my senior year the best thespian because I was in the International Thespian Society, of course. Um, because I worked the most hours of anyone in my class. Um, not on stage where I wanted to be, but backstage and everywhere else. You see a pattern here? 
Do you see how this, yeah. I'm thinking about this as I'm preparing this, going, oh my gosh, did they know they were getting me ready for Project Shakespeare when I hit 40? How could they? But, um, and Virginia Worthington, the, the mean, tough one, I, can't, I asked her before I left, I said, why did I never get like a, a, a good role? Why did I never get a lead? Why was it always the cheerleader or the popular people? And she said, because you're the one that's going to go into theater. You're the one who really needs to know these lessons. You're the one who needs this training, this overall training about theater, not just how to get on stage and, and sing or act or whatever. And I went, oh, OK. So I didn't learn till the end that she really did. You know, She liked me. <laughs> um, so then it was college. And the first school I went to was, look at that. I haven't even looked at my notes. The first school I went to was a very a large school um, with a large program. Um, and so I got cast in the first show, and I went, oh, I got cast. Yay. I got cast in the spring musical. I was cast as Aldonza in Man of La Mancha for about a week. <laughs> yes. Um, they fired me. Did you know that that was a thing in college? They can fire you? <laughs> They did. They fired me and put my best friend in the role. Yes. But of course, what else did I do? I did tech. I did sets. I did props. Um, and I took this little, little tiny role, like at two lines, because I said, I've got to be in the show somewhere. And so I guess by then, and you've sort of gotten the idea, is it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I had to be in theater, and nothing was going to deter me. Um, it didn't matter how much rejection I got. I left that school, though, to go to a school in Kansas City, where my teacher was a professional actor at the repertory company, Missouri Rep. And finally, finally, I met other students who I worked well with, and finally I got to do acting. Um, and it was there that I got to do Macbeth, um, The Third Witch, and uh, Lady Macduff which I can only tell you the thing I remember the most about their production is laying dead on the stage and a mouse running across me. Um, was that scripted? It wasn't. Improvisation on the part of the mouse. Um, and there were four of us, and we joined this little ensemble. We happened to all be Jewish. That was just coincidence. Um, so we were this Jewish ensemble, but really what it was is that we chose plays, and when it wasn't the department doing a play, we picked more plays. And we were always performing, always working. And it was great. Uh, one of the women that was part of that foursome has been running a theater called the Unicorn Theater in Kansas City now for 40 some odd years. Um, so it's interesting. The, the two women in that group, we went on to do theater. Who knows where the guys went? So then it was time for acting school. And I applied to all of the acting schools. And I got rejected by them all. OK, maybe this is why when my students get rejected, I can like know how they're feeling, because that was me. I didn't get into any of them. But again, I was not going to be deterred. So I moved to San Francisco, where um, American Conservatory Theater was. I could enroll in their summer congress. They called it a summer program, which basically was like in 10 weeks or eight weeks, I don't remember. And they trained you to then audition for their big, you know, two-year or four-year program. So, um, so I did that summer, and I really didn't like it, but knew that I was supposed to like it because it was a big la di da acting program. Why, why aren't you liking this? Why don't you like? going out and studying pigeons and then getting up on stage and pretending you're a pigeon and then trying to figure out pretending a pigeon has some relevance to this character. I, it just it didn't work for me, but I really, really, really tried. Um, and of course, did I get into the fall program? Of course not. No, no. Um, so then that, that fall, I took their evening classes. You know how the Harvard has the Harvard extension? Yeah, ACT had evening classes. It was the same teachers, except the classes were smaller, and most of the people in the classes didn't care as much as I did. So they were never prepared, and I was always prepared. I always had another monologue or another scene. 
So that's what I did. But also that summer, which was great, is that I auditioned for the Berkeley Shakespeare Festival. And I did get cast. I did Lady Anne in Richard III, and I did Margaret in Much Ado About Nothing. And even more importantly, I had a woman who mentored me and really taught me the, the fundamentals of acting in the Berkeley Shakespeare Festival, Julia Odegaard. She was wonderful. And so even though I was in this fancy schmancy acting school where I was supposed to be learning all these things, it was really on stage in this company working with actors that I started to learn my craft and felt really good about Shakespeare. Um, I was five foot, I'm only five foot seven now, but I was five foot nine. <laughs> and, um, and I've always been a, a, a big girl. And when I'm on stage, I have a lot of energy. And, and so Shakespeare felt good. The dynamics of Shakespeare, they're huge, right? These are big, big characters with big, big things going on, right? Lady Anne, I mean, here's Richard III, you know, who just killed my husband, now trying to woo me. That's, that's a big, that's big emotions, that's big things. So I think that's where Shakespeare certainly, certainly took hold. Um, from the time that I was in high school all the way through college and then into my 20s, I always did summer stock. Um, back row of musicals, but Shakespeare. In Santa Barbara, I got to do a Helen and Midsummer Night's Dream. In uh, Westerly, Rhode Island was my first Hamlet. I was Gertrude. I sort of fell in love with my Hamlet. Um, and so, so Shakespeare became sort of the, the place that I felt really, really comfortable. And the theater, the, the stories that I felt really good telling. And why not? Because who tells the story about being a human being better than Shakespeare? So San Francisco, I thought I was doing well. It was time to hit New York City. So I moved to New York City. You know what you do as an actor in New York City? You go to a lot of auditions, you knock on a lot of doors, you wait tables, you clean houses, you are a secretary, you're anything you can. 24 seven, you're making money to pay for the really expensive apartment so you can go to those auditions. Um, but after two years, and I auditioned for them a couple of times, I think, I did get cast in the National Shakespeare Company. Not, not their first choice. Someone quit at the last moment, and then they called me. See, there is a pattern, isn't there, Judy? There's this pattern, right? But never in the midst of any of this rejection did I ever think I'm not going to do this. It never crossed my mind at all not to just continue going forward. So National Shakespeare Company, for nine months I did Shakespeare. I did 110 Kates in Taming of the Shrew. 110. I wish I could tell you I had really good Petruchios, but I didn't. <laughs> My first one actually left the tour at Christmas because he fell in love with Grumio. And he went off with Grumio. And then the next Petruchio they got was about two feet shorter than I was. So he came up to like here on me. Um, so he played it kind of like a little Napoleon or something. Anyway, it was bizarre. But I also got to play Ariel in Tempest, and then I also got to be in Richard II. And the actor who played Richard II, which of course most schools didn't want to see. You know these tours, they put it out to schools and the schools get to choose what play they, they want to see. Um, Richard II got like a handful of productions. But it was Mark Ralston who went on, and I don't know if you know who he is, but he got to do the Alien films. and. Uh, and he was blonde and really good looking, so he played like the leading guy, but then when he lost his hair, he got real evil looking. So I've seen him in films now once in a while, he always plays the bad guy. So the National Shakespeare Company, I met someone. I'm getting there, I'm getting to Project Shakespeare, I really am. I met someone who lived in Boston, and I auditioned for the theater company he worked for, and I got cast, and so I moved to Boston and I ran the public theater in Boston, which is no longer there, 
but uh, I did that for almost 20 years. Give us a year. When is that happening? Ah, uh, that is 80s? early 80s, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm 27 when I go out on the tour, so I'm 28 or so when I get to Boston. Um, and again, thing happens to me in the sense of I got cast until there were things that needed to be done that no one else would do and I would do them. So somehow I got transitioned from actor to marketing director to executive director, which executive director sounds pretty, you know, la-di-da, except that I got less and less and less acting roles. I did get to do uh, Beatrice and Much Ado, I got to do Portia, I got to do another Helena in Midsummer Night's Dream, um, but I didn't get to do acting because I would do everything else. Again, rejection, only that was pretty personal rejection because it was my partner who was rejecting me. So what do you do? You go to Chicago for two winters while you try to figure out what you're going to do. And uh, Chicago in the winter is a really cold place, but it is a community that is very collaborative. Uh, and the theater companies there, you know, you've heard of Steppenwolf um, and Victory Gardens and just so many of them. They really are built on this group of actors that get together and create. And I applied to Emerson College in Boston and I got accepted and I went to Emerson. And at Emerson, um, I learned that there was drama in education and theater in education. Theater in education is the performance part of it. Drama in education is what does drama, what do you telling these stories, to get back to the title of what I thought this was called, uh, stories to tell. Um, what do those stories teach you about yourself in terms of not just, just, um, not just self-esteem kind of things, because that's always the thing that people draw to when they think about the arts. Oh, the kids have great self-esteem. Well, there's really more fundamental things that they learn. Problem solving, right? Here's Hamlet, he's in this situation. Problem solve how he does this how he gets out of the situation. It's creative, it's imaginative, self-awareness, trusting, generosity. All of these things are the skills that you learn. And at Emerson, they brought over these, this Brit um, theater educator and who was much in the line of, I don't know, you've probably never heard of Dorothy Hethcote, but she, is a, she was a big, big, big deal in, in England. And she did things like worked with children, worked with young boys who were in the um, prison, prison system for, for kids. I don't know, prison what would be the name for it anyway. Um, and she would work with them doing things um, like, like handing them a gun, right? An imaginary gun, which they would work with. And then they would get up and they would do this whole story. And when they would shoot each other, dead, the kid would get up and she'd go, oh no, darling, no, you're really dead. And these kids had never thought about that the violence that they did was real. And she would teach them this. I'm not phrasing this very well. This wasn't in my planned notes. Um, but it's the thing of using theater to teach children about who they are, about how they tell their stories, about their lives. And so that was the drama and education part was learning these skills. And then there was the performance part. Well, I knew, I, I knew what the performance part was from being an actor, but I was really interested in this drama and education. And so for my thesis, I wanted to combine the two. You know, you go to see children's theater or youth theater, and, and they all stand up there and they're, they're smiling and they're loud enough for their parents and everyone's really proud of them. And that's what I thought children's theater was or youth theater was. And I went, no, it doesn't have to be that. It can be more than that. There's no reason why those children can't do the very same work that I was doing as a professional actor and learning all the skills that a Dorothy Hethcote would be teaching 
those, those boys in, in the prison about what it is to be, you know, consequences of your actions, things like that. So I chose The Taming of the Shrew because it was a story about a woman finding her voice and I needed to find my voice and I needed a story to tell. And the young woman that I chose to be the lead in it from um, the subscribers to my theater, I got all of those, their kids to come do this with me. I said, can you do me a favor and, and do this play with me? And so they said, sure, we'll do this. Um, and this is a young woman who was, she was big and she was strong and she was intimidating, even at, at however old she was, maybe 13 or 14. She was just a really tough, tough cookie. And um, my, my mentor teacher from Emerson had worked with her the summer before and said, oh my gosh, you're working with her? Whew. You know, she chewed me up and spit me out. This was a tough, tough kid. This turned out to be the perfect thing for her because Kate showed her how she could use her voice. You know, Kate at the beginning of Taming of the Shrew was screaming and yelling and, and, and no one likes her because she doesn't know how to use her voice, how to tell her story. And so through this play, this young woman got to find out, oh, how do I take this energy? How do I take this, all this energy that I have and how do I tell my story in a productive way? So I did Taming of the Shrew. It was a success. Um, it also made money for the theater company because I did it under the auspices of the public theater, which I was the executive director of. And so not only did I get my master's, but I had created this great program. But that wasn't where I thought I was pivoting to. I thought I was pivoting to become a drama teacher in a high school. And I did get hired by a high school, <laughs> Waltham High School, if you know Waltham and outside of Boston. And they had a professional company um, and the director thought that I would be just a perfect match for that. That when he eventually retired, I could take over this professional company because I had all this professional experience. It was great. Until it wasn't. Until what they thought was a perfect fit wasn't a perfect fit. Until I did things like teach my ninth grade English class, Henry V and showed them Kenneth Branagh, right, carrying a young Christian Bale across the fields um, of France. And the, and the kids are weeping, and, and, and this teacher was in there observing me, and he said, how dare you do that to these children? That was traumatizing. Why are you doing Henry V with ninth graders? That's way above what they can do. And I went, no, it's not. So. Basically, they, they don't fire you, they just don't rehire you. Um, so I wasn't rehired. Um, but, but, oh, this is where you come in. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a tough year for me. Plus, they had me teaching classes I wasn't even qualified to teach. And I was crying in my room a lot. So we could, I could hear the teacher next door, and he was teaching The Tempest. And I was listening to him teach The Tempest, and I went, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Oh, that's really good. Oh, I love that. And I'm listening, and I'm listening, and I'm listening. Needless to say, he also probably heard me crying in my room. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a little story, but I ended up marrying that teacher next door. So, and that's Stephen right there. So, <laughs> yay. And so that was the good thing. That was the good thing about, about the Waltham High School experience. I also got to do a great Midsummer Night's Dream, and I also got to meet a lot of students there who became part of Project Shakespeare. How am I doing for time? Good. Um, so I clearly didn't fit into the bureaucracy or the structure of, a, of, of, of high schools, of schools. Um, they said I was too progressive, that I wanted to do things my own way. All the things that are perfect when you're starting your own company. So fast forward, Project Shakespeare keeps doing well. And for the first, oh, I even wrote this part down. How many years? How many years? Here we go. 
The first seven years of Project Shakespeare, from 94 to 2000, I did it at the Public Theater in Boston. Um, then for four years, I did it at the Lyric Stage, which is still a professional company in Boston, if you go into Boston and see theater. I did it for one year in Nashua, because Stephen lived in Nashua, so we moved up there. Well, he moved up there and I followed. Um, and we did it as, I did it as part of their enrichment program. But it was 2006 that, oh, and we got married in 2000. We moved out here to the Monadnock region. This is really where Project Shakespeare takes off. But I guess I spent a half an hour telling you what led up to it, because this is what I discovered when I was thinking about this. All the rejections you have in life, all the things you don't get that you think you want, and that the things that you do get that you didn't know that you wanted are preparing you for something, are preparing you for what is next that you're going to do in your life. And so rejection isn't really rejection. It's just life saying, hey, look over here instead. Hey, what about over there? And so all that rejection, all of the costume shops I worked in and sets I worked in and publicity and all of that was just my training for Project Shakespeare. And Project Shakespeare is the story I have to share, to tell, now in my life. And it's the place where I think I've gotten to make a difference in this world. And that's, again, where us as a divided country can come together because who doesn't want to make a difference in this world? Who doesn't want to think that the place is just a little bit better because you lived here? Because you talked to that one person, because you reached out to this human being. You want to think that. And so Project Shakespeare has given me that. And crazy enough, Boston, which is a huge market, and even Nashua, which is a bigger city, the program stayed a summer company. In the summer, I did Shakespeare. And then I substitute taught or whatever, or I did a lot of artist in residence kind of things in a bunch of different schools. But it was coming here to this very small community where there's a very small pool of kids where Project Shakespeare really took off. Pre-pandemic, um, I was up to 12 to 14 projects a year. My husband will attest to this. <laughs> it wasn't until the pandemic that I started to cook dinner. Really, it wasn't until the pandemic that I actually cooked a dinner for us. Otherwise, he did it all. He did the cleaning. He did, I just didn't know, I didn't not do it on purpose. I just didn't know it existed because Project Shakespeare so consumed my life. And I was doing homeschool classes. I was doing a project in February, one in April. We expanded the summer to three shows. I did staged readings. We began Christmas Carol in 2009, which I do every single year now. I've done 14 or 15, what was the last one, 15? 15, 15 of those. Um, so really for me, the pandemic was a good thing in the sense that it told me to kind of slow down. Also, this kind of presentation made me be self-reflective and know how it is I got here and what is important about Project Shakespeare. And it's working with these students who are like me, who maybe have gotten rejected in a bunch of other places or not, who felt fringe, who felt they didn't connect with the kids at school or they weren't good at sports or whatever. They found a home in Project Shakespeare. And I'm still close with many of them who are now hitting 40. Boy, does that make you feel old when your students are now have kids of their own. In 2019 was our, my 25th anniversary, and um, a bunch of them came back, and we did King Lear in three days. Three days, and we did King Lear at Aldworth Manor. Um, so, and here I am. Oh, and England, England. So one of my students from Peterborough, uh, Christopher Commander, happened to come from the UK. 
And he said, you know, the Royal Shakespeare Company has an outdoor theater and they're inviting companies to come perform there. Why doesn't Project Shakespeare apply? And this was in 2013 and I went, are you crazy? But we did and we got chosen. And so in 2014, we did Hamlet. We went back in 2018 and did Romeo and Juliet. And then this year in August, Oh, this is a nice segue, isn't it, Ben? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this year, we are going to, um, they've opened a new outdoor theater in the Suffolk area of England. Um, and so we are, I applied there, and I might have gotten rejected as an actor, but my theater company doesn't get rejected happily <laughs> enough. Um, and so we're doing two performances of Hamlet at the Thornton Theater, and then we're going to the Royal Shakespeare Company and doing one performance um, at the Dell, which is right outside the, the Royal Shakespeare Company, and a stone's throw from where Shakespeare is buried. And then we are zooming to London to see Midsummer Night's Dream and Macbeth at the Globe Theater before I send them all back home and I get to stay and have a vacation. <laughs> so, um, so that's Project Shakespeare. Um, over the years, what I've really learned is it is it does transform kids. It transforms me every single time I do it. And the best thing I can say about this is that it's taught me about collaboration. And what this community has taught me is about collaboration. In the sense of the support that I get from this community, again, it's a teeny tiny community. And yet it's here that this company has flourished. I kind of like to think it's because what I do is singular to my company and that there is a need, not a need by hundreds of kids, but a need from 10 or 15 of them at a time. And, and they get to tell stories and they get to make friendships that they hold on to their entire, you know, their lives and, um, and they grow and this is where I'm going to bring you into this, Benjamin. So, okay, I have to tell this story. <laughs> this is the story that all of you have already heard, right? I'm substitute teaching in Peterborough Elementary School, and I get a call to go to Mr. Marion? Marine. Marine. What is it? Marine. Marine, okay, to his room because a student wants to talk to me. So I go there. And a five-year-old, Benjamin Mishu, says to me, I've wanted to be on the stage my whole life. <laughs> All five years of it. And so that's where we started working together. And Ben has been in Christmas carols. He's done all the summers. He's now 15. He's now about to play Hamlet. And this is where, instead of a great slideshow behind me where I could show you pictures, if you want to see pictures about Project Shakespeare Productions, go to projectshakespeare.org. They're all there. But if you want to see sort of what it's like inside the rehearsal hall, that's what this next, like, 10 minutes is going to be. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Have I bored you guys? No. No? This was okay? Perfect. Oh, and I never looked at my notes. Crazy, huh? All right. So, um... The first thing when we're starting work on a show is, um, is you really have to talk about what the given circumstances are. So what are the given circumstances for Hamlet? What happens before Hamlet even appears on page one? And what has happened, Benjamin? Come on up and share the stage with me. So what has happened? So um, Hamlet's father, King Hamlet has just passed, uh, and he's off at school in Germany uh, with his friends Horton, no, not Horton Rose. Uh, <laughs> Come on. Rosencrantz, Guildenstern, and Horatio. They're all at, at school in Germany together. He learns of his father passing. Okay, whoa, 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 I'm going to stop you right there. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, what did King Hamlet do when he was still alive, before he died? What did King Hamlet do? He was uh, fighting war with Horton Brass. Okay, Horton Brass of what country? Norway. Norway, that's right. Okay. So, um, and did he beat Fortinbras? He did. Yeah. He did. And did he take some of his country? Yes, he took some of his lands. Okay. 
So King Hamlet is dead. How did King Hamlet die? Well, we don't know this quite yet, but uh, his brother King Claudius has uh, poisoned him uh, okay. while he's taking a walk in the gardens. Uh, he's sleeping in the gardens and he pours it in, it in his ear. Okay. Um, and actually, where to be or not to be, and that's the speech we're going to look at, um, is actually in Act 3, Scene 1. So we do know that. So, yeah. so King Hamlet as a ghost has come to you, and what has he said to you? He said, Besides, this, hi, son, nice to see yeah. you. He said, uh, this is what has happened to me. King Claudius has killed me. My brother. My, my brother has killed me, uh, and I want you to go avenge my death. And okay. Kill King All right. So you hear about this, and so not only is your father dead, Claudius is now what? Married to my mother. Uh, Gertrude. And he is what? He's now, he's king now. He's king. When I should be king. When you should be king. All right. So in the two months that he learns about this, he has now come back. And by the time he gets there, and we actually looked at a map to find out where Wittenberg was in Germany and how long it would take. I called Stephen up. I said, why does it take two months? And he goes, well, look at the map. And this is how many hundreds of years ago? And, you know, they couldn't just get on a plane and fly there. So um, by the time he gets back, it's, it's the funeral and then the coronation then the, of, of King Hamlet and Gertrude and their wedding, all basically as you've walked in, to the court. Yeah. All right. So um, by the time you get you gets to, to be or not to be, the players have come. Yeah. And and what have you talked to the players about? Talked to the players about trying to to guilt Claudius into confessing. Okay, so they're gonna put on a play. Yeah. And try and, you know, extract the truth out of Claudius. Okay. Since he's a because have you been able to act on this thing that your dad has asked you to do yet? No. No. Okay. Um, so the last thing that you say before to be or not to be is that you will catch the king by doing this play. Right? And now you've got a plan. And now you are going to act. And yet the very next thing that you say is, first line. To be or not to be. Okay, which can mean what? Could mean to live, to die, or to, to act or not to act. Okay. All sorts of things. All right, so that in this speech, you are now thinking about consequences. Right. Okay, so let's work through this speech and, and, and really talk, talk to them. Also, it's a soliloquy. So when, I'm sorry, I'm back to you. Um, soliloquies is when a character is alone on stage talking to the audience and trying to figure out a problem. So this is problem solving for Hamlet, okay? Does he live, does he die, does he act, does he not act? And what are the consequences of those things? So let's look at this. <clears throat> to be or not to be, that is the question. Okay, now stop. Now I want you, you know that line. Yep. I want you to look at these people and get them set up. Okay, so they really know it. So they're really looking at them. Okay, talk to them. Talk to them. Come on up. I don't care about the camera and stuff. No, don't worry about it. Talk to them because, again, if we talk about stories and we talk about the human condition, is this some place where we all can come together in terms of to live or not to live? Yeah. Will all of us in this room die yeah. at some point? Yeah. Okay, and all of us are now living? So we know about this existential threat, okay? Oh, and the existential threats on him are Claudius, who, who doesn't want him around, and Fortinbras, of course, had a son who wants those lands back. So he's got these existential forces working against him. But look at them now and, and, and figure out this problem. Do I live? Do I act? What do I do? And look right at them. or not to be? That is the question. Okay, one more time. At the end of to be or not to be, he has an end stop, a colon. He's telling you to take a breath there, right? So that you're looking at them, right? To be or not to be. Let that sit with the audience. And then say, 
Yes. Okay. Again, look at the look at the to be or not to be. That is the question. Okay. Continue. Whether it is nobler in the mob to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arm against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Okay, what are your choices there? Is it better to, to just let everything happen and suffer the consequences, or is it to just kill yourself, like to just stop? Okay. And what are the slings and arrows? What is the outrageous fortune? The fact that all this has happened, that Claudius is king and I'm not. Right, that your father is dead, father that your mother's remarried. Dead. All of this has happened, right, within two months, and no one consulted you, no one talked to you. Okay, they've done all of this without you. All right. Love your mother? Absolutely. Yes. Did you love your father? Yeah. Yeah. Do you love Claudius? Okay, but he's king. He's king. Okay. So, let's continue. Where were we? Um, but you take arms against, okay, so, or by opposing end them. Okay, so do I suffer or do I act? Right? That's what you've just asked them. That's what you're asking them. Do I suffer? Do you all, do you suffer or do you act upon something? What do you do? Continue. To die. To sleep. Okay, now, now what's he doing there? He's trying to reason with himself the possibility of dying. Like, what is dying exactly? Is it, is it just, is it a release from life or is it just like going to sleep and just never waking up? Okay, so let's explore this with him. So to die, to sleep. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep. No, no, you, you, oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're in the right place. I'm in the wrong place. Yep, go ahead. Sorry. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. Okay. So you die and all your problems go away. Yeah. <gasps> that doesn't sound bad, does it? No. Hmm. Okay. Let's explore this further. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. Okay, because you don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's got to make you stop and go, okay, maybe, maybe Is this isn't so good. Yeah. Is this good? All right, continue. There's the respect. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would Okay, bear? so before we get here, we have a list here. And when Shakespeare has a list, he's telling you to build it, to build it, to build it. And you've got seven things here that you're building. Okay? Go ahead. So start. Don't give yourself some place to go. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong? That's two. The proud man's contumely. Yes. The pangs of disprized love. Yes. The law's delay. Yes. The insolence of office mm -hmm. and the spurs that the patient merit of unworthy takes when he himself is quietest mate with a bare bodkin. Okay, so now you've listed all of them, right? Who would bear the whips and scorns of time? Oppressor's wrong. Proud man's wrong. You've listed them, listed them, listed them. And it takes you to what? What's a bare bodkin? Oof. An unsheathed dagger. An unsheathed dagger. Okay. <laughs> In Project Shakespeare, we say you can never have too many daggers. Okay, daggers are important. Okay, do that again and now really build, build those and use those words, the whips and scorns. Use especially the, the adjective, but use the verbs. Okay, use those, color those words. All right, for who would bear? For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the yes. law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When Keep he going. himself might his quietest mate with a bare bodkin. Okay. Right? Quiet, quietus is released from life, okay? Now, do that one more time. Now, really build it. 
Okay, really build it. Think, think that they're just piling up, like something's piling up on you. Okay, again there. For who would bear? For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? Go. The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprised love, the laws delayed, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietness make with a bare bodkin. With a ba yeah, and then with a, right, looking at that, a bare bodkin. Because here it is. Here, here's the thing that can either to be or not to be you, right? There it is. All right. Keep going. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something... Okay, don't, don't go over the butt, because that, that's your butt. Right. However, right, go back to who would fardels bear. Uh, fardels is, is burdens. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a, re a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from who's born no traveler returns, puzzles the will, and makes us rather bear those ills we have than to fly others that we know not. Yeah, you, when we work on that, you want to make that all one thought, because what are you saying there? Why, why would we go when we don't know what's happening? Yeah, the, the, the fear, right? Yeah. The, the fear that we have of death, the fear of what's coming next, is so big, is so huge, that it paralyzes us. For Hamlet, you haven't been able to act. Part of this is the fear of the consequences that are coming up, okay? So again, you're working with your audience to figure that out. Okay, let's not leave them hanging. Let's give them the conclusion here. <laughs> Thus conscious. Thus conscious does make cowards of us all. And isn't that the conclusion? That is the conclusion. Yeah, that we all don't commit suicide to get rid of our problems because we don't know what's coming up next. And a whole bunch of other things probably too, though. Okay, and thus? And thus, if the native hue of resolution is sickly o'er with a pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. And who knows what the speech will look like by the time we actually get it up on stage. Um, I did want to do something with all of you, but I was told that audience participation was maybe not something that was part of this. <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll do it in rehearsal. Oh, yeah. We will. So anyway, thank you, Benjamin. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Did I do OK? Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not going to be rejected. <laughs> Thank you. This was quite a treat, and I suspect people have some thoughts or questions, and I think I'll begin. Oh. And my question is this. Yes. Looking back over these 29 years, do you have any regrets? No. You asked me that on the phone, too. But you gave me a different answer. No, I didn't. I just you... thought about it a lot longer. <laughs> I think I went, you no. told me, yes, I regret that I didn't start doing it early. Oh. Well, but you know what? And why that, that's not a very good answer and why that really isn't true? Because if I hadn't gone through all of that stuff that I bored you with for the first half hour of this meeting, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am now to do what it is I do. So I wouldn't have learned those lessons. So if I'd gone into theater education at 20, what experience would have informed my work? Well, maybe so, but if only all of us could say of whatever it is that we're doing, I wish I'd done it even longer, that wouldn't be a bad way to feel. Well, Questions, yes. Longer like, like I want to keep going. Just a comment, I think you're High school teacher gave you the greatest gift in not uh, putting you on the stage as an actor, but giving you that background that has prepared you. But you don't know it at that time. No, you don't. Every time someone says no and squishes your dream, you think, um, you think, oh my gosh, what? I, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. But I think then looking back, you said, but what did you do? You put your foot forward and you kept moving forward. 
So, um, so yeah, I think so too. I'm really curious how old she really was at the time, though. It's funny, you know, because now that I'm 69, I think, huh, was she really like 40 or? I mean, because she just seemed like this old, old little woman who was just so tough. Um, I'd love to see her now, but I had a teacher who my mother had. <laughs> Want to talk about tough? Like the best teacher. See, I've ever had. there you go. There you yes, talking about Grace. Who are you talking Grace. about, Grace? <laughs> yeah, Grace. <laughs> I am here too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing I've witnessed the masterpiece here as a psychologist, I celebrate your revelation, your risk, and lay your soul out for all of us. And what it's done for you too, I guess. But as a community member, I just have to say how much over the last 20 years I've enjoyed your young people, um, the confidence that they have that they've developed with you is amazing. They're going on to great things. Thank you. Thank you. What's what's great, and I I do keep in touch with so many of them. And where, I don't know, maybe 10 or so are still in either, you know, there's, there's one who's on television who's, who's in a, a show, Barry. I don't know if you all know that one anyway. Um, and I've got some kids who do some theater here and there. But a lot of them have gone on to do service type of work, whether it's lawyers or in the medical profession. They want to do something good for the world. And again, make the world a better place. And to me, that's... With their stories. Yeah. yeah, kids do. Were you involved, Deborah, with the the, uh, the big on the common Shakespeare production in Boston? Yeah. Oh gosh, no. No. Who who was behind those? Uh, that started out of ART. Oh, from yeah. Cambridge. Yes. Yes. Oh. No. No. I'm 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 really small potatoes. I am teeny tiny little low guy down there. I those people don't know who I am, and and they are yeah no that that's yeah that's because that's that very popular. Well, that's big time. Well, yeah. that's big time. Who you are is this a unique program? In other words, if I were to go to Missouri or God help us Tennessee or wherever, <laughs> would I find something like this? You would find teachers doing Shakespeare with students, um, how they approach it. I, well, no, because I think it's unique to, to me and, and how I see the world. I really try to bridge the, the script to their lives and then that to the performance and to the community. So in Hamlet, for example, it's a young man put in a situation where he's just getting squeezed by these existential threats. How has it felt? And all of us in this room knows what it's like to be in a position where you don't know where to turn. You don't know how to act because the, the pressures on you are so immense. Um, so I try to find that, you know, Taming of the Shrew. I've talked about a young woman finding her voice. Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is a, is a climate change play. It's an environmental play, right? They, they, they turn Oberon and Titania, they, they're, they're arguing, turns the seasons upside down. So these plays, and, and as I keep working on them over the years, 29 years, the story changes each time because our world changes. Um, certainly in terms of now being a divided world, changes how we approach things. So I would like to think that there are other programs that are out there. Um, if there are, I just don't know about them. Vermont, Vermont. Yes, over here. Can I speak to that? Just a minute. Oh, yeah. There's a PS parent. As a PS parent for 10 years now, yeah. and, and now a friend and board member, one of the things, uh, I've only ever known Deborah's craft and the excellence that she creates with her students. Um, to hear families come in with their students the first time that they try Project Shakespeare, I can't tell you how many parents have come up to me afterward and said, oh, like this is real theater. They thought that they were going to see their kids stand up and, you know, regurgitate the lines and wear the costume. Uh, Hi, Mom! And, yeah. uh, you know, and the dad had sort of resigned himself, and he was like, oh, no, they actually know what they're doing. Like, the absolute relief of other people who have seen other 
versions of youth theater and the quality that Deborah brings is substantial. Because I learned you can work with little ones. I mean, I've done Shakespeare with four-year-olds. You can do it with kids who don't even know how to read yet. You don't need to. You know, they just repeat the lines, when shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? I mean, you can get them started on Macbeth, and you can teach them that scene in five minutes. Their little brains are sponges. They just absorb it. And you can have them, and they play actions. That's the biggest thing, too. And, and, and I did... Um, I've, I almost crossed that line in terms of where I take these students emotionally, and I really try to think in terms of actions. What are they doing? Because when you get to do emotions, it can get in a really dicey place, psychologist here. Um, I did a play at Conval, um, which was the Downing of Pan Am 103, and the students were reliving, if you will, what happened when those students went back to that place, and what is it like to be a mother of a child who died? And, Anyway, it was, it was heavy, heavy stuff. I tend to pick nice, light little plays like that. Um, but it was one where, where I realized I could go too far. And emotionally, you just don't want to take kids there. You want them to play the action, and then the emotion is the sweat of the action, if you will. Um, taking them down these dark places in terms of character and stuff, Maybe some other teacher will do that with them. I don't know. But so, so I really talk to them about playing actions. But a four-year-old can play an action as well as a 15-year-old as well as, you know. It's, it's more the Brit one. Both. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, Deborah, uh, Ben, thank you very much for adding so much to our presentation today. Good luck when you go off and do this in England. I think it will be a great adventure. Can I pitch? Hmm? Can I make a pitch before I leave? You may. Okay. We're raising $30,000 to take these kids to England. Uh, the Putnam Foundation, thank you very much, has given us $2,600, which will pay for one student completely. Um, Project Shakespeare pays 40% of everything for these kids. Um, and then we pay for all of the theater stuff. So if you can help in terms of just getting the word out there, um, send in your five or ten bucks, um, whatever, to help us. That would be great. And that's my pitch for the and night. And if anybody <laughs> is online and would like to support this uh, trip to England for the students, just uh, send your check, Payable Project Shakespeare, here to the Jaffrey Civic Center, and we'll be sure it gets to you, Deborah. Thank you so much Thank for coming you. today. Uh, I did it. We'll have a little. <laughs> we'll have our reception afterwards, but next month, which will be the last presentation for this season, it will be on May 5. And Steve Helke, who among other things began Atlas Fireworks, is going to be our speaker. And uh, you can come here for fireworks and to uh, hear not only about his stories, but maybe a little bit about Jaffrey's 250th, of which he is the chair, I believe. So come next month, and thanks for coming today.